as right now. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Good afternoon. Happy New Year. And welcome everyone to the Bethel Dukes January presentation. My name is Ida Jones. I'm the branch president of the Bethel Dukes branch located in Washington, DC, the former far Northeast Southeast branch. There are two other branches located in the small area of Washington, DC. We are one of a small but mighty number of branches in the area. We are, were founded in the 1970s. We were then started in 1983. I will ask everyone to please mute their microphone. And we are recording this. We'd ask everyone to kind of keep themselves off camera as well <laughs> so that we can have a clean recording. And uh, we are represented. Sorry, Ida. I'll, I'll turn yours back on. And we're representing the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson and four other men in Chicago in 1915 in response to the film A Birth of a Nation in principle, but also to just the negative way in which African Americans were portrayed in the media and absent in the history books. Since 1915, the association has grown for 106 years strong into areas around the country and actually around the world. And we're excited to be in the 21st century, continue to keep the torch of learning and understanding the African contributions to the world history in the spirit of Carter G. Woodson. I'm gonna put in the chat information about our national organization, as well as what Eric mentioned about our branches and our YouTube channel, the Bethel Duke's YouTube channel sit back, relax, feel free to get your questions ready and enjoy our conversation in January. Thank you so much, Dr. Ball. Thank you, program committee and enjoy. Uh, Levanda. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Dr. Ball. Dr. Jared Ball is a father and a husband. After that, He's a professor of African-American and African diaspora studies at Morgan State in Baltimore, Maryland. He holds a PhD from the University of Maryland at College Park, an MA from Cornell Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell University, oh, and a BA from Frostburg State University. He's also the founder curator of imixwhatilike.org, a multimedia hub of emancipatory, emancipatory journalism and revolutionary beat reporting. From grassroots organization, independent journalism to academic research, Professor Ball has a wealth of experience and productions. His commentaries, essays, interviews, and statements have appeared in the Amsterdam News, DC India Media, Free Speech Radio News, the Institute for Public Accuracy, BlackCommentator.com, Pacifica Radio, and the Black Agenda Report, just to name a few. He's also the author of I Mix What I Like, a mixtape manifesto, and the co-editor of A Lie of Reinvention, Correcting Manning Marables, Malcolm X. His latest book, The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power, is the culmination of more than a decade of Dr. Ball's seminal research into the origins of buying power as a concept and its specific application to African America. For generations, Black people have been told that they have what is now said to be more than $1 trillion of buying power. In his book, he argues that commentators have misused this claim largely to blame the Black community for their own poverty based on squandered economic opportunity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ball today as he exposes this claim, refutes this myth and other related manipulation techniques. Dr. Ball, the floor is yours. 
Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, that introduction uh, and this invitation. Uh, and uh, I recognize uh, the history and the importance of this organization. I definitely appreciate being invited to this particular branch. Uh, and I look forward to uh, uh, this discussion. Um, what I will do is is just give a, a, a short overview presentation of the work, and then hopefully we can get to um, a, a discussion, uh, a more direct engaged discussion um, as soon as possible. Uh, so if it's all right, I am going to share my screen and there we go. Um, just right off the top, uh, if anybody wants to follow up, um, as was said, uh, as, and as is shown at the bottom there, I mix what I like org. And if you're engaged on social media, uh, I'm at I mix what I like for pretty much all platforms. Um, and again, just quickly, uh, I mix what I like is an homage to Steve Biko's I write what I like, and I'm happy to discuss that at another time more in detail. But anyway, that's just what that where that comes from. All right, uh, let's go. All right, so uh, as you heard, and I think as many of you are already aware, uh, it's almost impossible to escape the claim. Um, but we are told that, uh, as it is said now, most recently, that Black America has more than $1.4 trillion in buying power and that this equates to money, which can be used to close persistent gaps in economic material inequality. Um, uh, as I start in the book, <clears throat> we can maybe come back to this. I start by, by making note of how this uh, concept is popularly disseminated even before I get into, as I will in just a minute, uh, its origins and what it really means. But one reason why it's 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 uh, uh, it's uh, it it permeates so much, uh, particularly Black American culture. Although as I'll, as I'll explain, it's it's a concept applied to every group and every municipality, but has a specific history as it relates to Black people here in the United States. Well, one of the reasons is it's popularly rebranded and rephrased by a lot of uh, powerful emissaries, um, most recently and, and commonly in one version or another by Jay-Z. So I just wanted to start the book by pointing out that both Jay-Z and Fred Hampton um, share December 4th, 1969 in common. Of, co uh, of course, that's when Fred Hampton is assassinated and Jay-Z is born. Uh, um, 68, I believe, right? I think, oh my goodness, I should have that year right, but I think it's 68. Um, somebody, uh, you know, but anyway, they, one was assassinated, representing a liberation struggle headed towards socialism. One was born and who has touted capitalism, and particularly a brand of black capitalism throughout his entire career. Uh, and as I'll be arguing, and as I try to argue, black buying power is really a subset of the mythology of black capitalism, um, and uh, which is intentionally promoted specifically to dissuade black people and others, but particularly Black people from what is really the only power we can ever hope to have, which is political, built through social movements and not through building uh, an economic power that can never be achieved. So that's sort of my broad summarized argument. And then within that is the specific subset or, or, or yeah, sub, uh, subcategory of Black buying power, which is again, popularly, uh, uh, and intentionally propagated to Black people. Now, as it was said, and I do claim, there are those who use this mythology to uh, blame Black people for being poor, saying that uh, we lack a certain financial literacy uh, that prohibits us from, from accessing all the opportunity that, that, is, that does exist. But that's not entirely true. Some have misunderstood the mythology and miss, uh, and I think just accidentally or mistakenly attempted to apply it to their uh, politics and to their platform. Uh, uh, but but the two categories combined, those who do it by accident, those who do it intentionally, uh, have helped permeate this mythology. And then here are just some of the the luminaries historically 
that for one reason or another, and, and we can maybe come back to that <clears throat> and even debate that, but one reason or another, all of these, well, men depicted here <clears throat> and others uh, have attempted to apply this mythology. And one of my favorite uh, um, quote unquote discoveries, at least for me, was when Garvey in sort of joking in his public back and forth with Du Bois made the point that Du Bois was late and this actually relates to its transfer to Dr. Amos Wilson, which I'll come back to um, in just a minute. But but Garvey put, published in in in, a, in 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 his newspaper that that the the idea of buying power was where both he and Du Bois finally agreed. That Du Bois finally caught up, and in uh, um, in the 1930s, uh, and was seen as as adopting the buying power concept and trying to apply it now for his own political purposes. So, um, but all of these men, for again, not all for the same reason, not all for the same goals, or, um, but all of them have helped promote and, and continue to this day to propel the mythology. And that's one of the reasons why it, it persists. Um, so as I try to explain the mythology in its modern day sense, and I'll come back to its history in, 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 a, in a moment. In its modern day sense, it, it, is, it originates in the early 90s from the Selig Center, which is housed in the Terry Business School, the University of Georgia and the Bank of, Air, Bank of America, uh, in the Terry Business School, the Bank of America building at the University of Georgia. Um, and with its lead author, Jeffrey Humphreys, they have been producing what has been designed to help ad, ad buyers target their ad revenue with businesses. They've been promoting this, this, this buying power concept uh, uh, for black people and others, which has been picked up by many luminaries within our uh, activist and intellectual community. Uh, and misapplied and misunderstood. And unfortunately, for all the great work Dr. Amos Wilson has done, this was one area where he was mistaken. Uh, and he was one of the biggest, the first to adopt the, the, the Selig Center version of the mythology, promoted in his work, particularly in the Blueprint for Black Buying Power, and has helped, uh, 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 and through his unfortunate misreading and the constant misreadings of his work and others, uh, it continues to to again the mythology continues to to permeate, but it all it has only one source, which is the Selig Center. To this day, there is literally only one source for the production of this mythology, uh, and I in the book go through more more in detail how they concoct the mythology and for what purpose and how it gets picked up in the press and redisseminated and distributed without any uh, um, real investigation and just a lot of bad journalism and bad punditry. Uh, and uh, again, just creates an echo chamber that has gone for now 30 plus years. In this modern iteration, it actually predates that and I'm gonna to come to that in just a minute. But of all the luminaries, I do always like to point out that of all the, the, the luminaries I could find in our uh, history in, 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 in the, here in the United States, George Jackson is really the only one to have gotten it perfectly right. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, forgive me if I'm, uh, I'm hearing a, uh, some, some distracting background noise. I don't know if, could, could everybody just double check their mute button for, uh, uh, sorry, forgive me for that. It's just, thank you. Um, anyway, so George Jackson is the only one to have gotten it right. Uh, in the sense that as we're experiencing right now with, with the inflation, you know, for instance, at, at, in Maryland, we just got the cost of living adjustment. And then of course, everything is inflated to more or less balance it out. So as George Jackson said, so what is to be done after a revolution has failed? After our enemies have, have created a conservative mass society based on meaningless electoral politics, spectator sports, and a 3% annual rise in purchasing power, strictly re regulated to negate itself with a corresponding rise in the cost of living. <laughs> so he was right. Uh, whereas most people, um, King less so, but we can come back to that in terms of King didn't quite go into it and was was quite right in his analysis at the end about needing federal policy, which I'll come to is ultimately my argument as well. But but uh, George is really the only one to really to really nail it quite as as clearly as he did and accurately. Whereas everybody else is saying, wait, we're, it's reported that we have this pool of money. This now, as it's reported, one 
$1.4 trillion. If we just use it with greater financial literacy, with some degree of organized radicalism, we can do certain things. But as I'm going to continue to argue and try to show more clearly in just a minute, it doesn't exist. It's, it's a complete myth. Its origins come uh, uh, really in the, the turn of the century. Now, again, there has always been an idea that uh, Black people could, if not fully free ourselves, certainly improve our condition here in the United States if we engage in various levels of entrepreneurialism. Uh, if we, it, you know, from the moment of nominal freedom, if we just get involved in some business, we can get caught up and we can fix things. And once we get our money right, we can get our politics right, and then we can get catch up and really do some things. Uh, but at the turn of the century, there was a broader labor struggle, obviously, as is always, always the case, where with uh, increased industrialization, uh, labor in general was able to produce more. Uh, but at the same time, we're not being paid at, at, a, at a rate that kept up with what they were producing for the capitalist elite. So there were some, some uprisings and protests. So uh, out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics that was created in the, the late 19th century, uh, by the turn of the century, they created the, the, the cost of living survey specifically to, to, to figure out exactly at what point they could pay working people low enough to suppress wages and increase profits but high enough that these working people would be able to buy the things in the society, consume everything in society and be relatively happy enough not to rebel. So that was really the origin between the political elite and the economic elite of the day to see how do we create this? And then as a subset of that, they came up with this category of buying power. That is how much money uh, or how much can be bought in the economy with whatever people are being paid. By the middle of the 20th century, specifically when it was applied to Black people in the United States, it became a propagated, propagandized weapon to say Black people can achieve and do well within this capitalist economy, don't want to rebel, and if you just redirect some corporate ad revenue to black owned businesses and media outlets through trickle down, we can, we can all work this thing out. So again, just skipping ahead for the sake of time. Um, I won't play the video and I'm not sure if you could even hear it, but, but I, I would encourage everybody to see the full video. This is just a clip from uh, Selling the Negro from John H. Johnson. And this is sort of a point. So I, I, I briefly explained the origins of the turn of the century of where this concept comes from and why it was developed. Post the Second World War, the United States, of course, had this multiple pronged need to both project American capitalism as the world's savior uh, and to to do to project that same myth internally to suppress the inequalities here at home. So uh, there was there was an enormous amount of propaganda, state sponsored, corporate sponsored, uh, Edward Bernays involved, et cetera, to 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 wed the concepts of capitalism to democracy to freedom, from cons consumerism to good American to liberation, to achievement and success. And then when it was applied specifically to black people, John H. Johnson stepped up and said, let me take advantage of this. And this sort of started a trend, or I'm, I, I point to it as a turning point in a trend where black, the black press, the commercial media, black media environment uh, uh, in collusion with the state and with the corporate uh, elite of the day said, look, I will sell you a fantasy of Black Americans just wanting to be middle class and just wanting to, to be good Americans and not wanting to rebel and, and being good consumers. Um, if you give us the ad revenue, that will help us make money, stay afloat, and do whatever else we want to do as a Black bourgeois capitalist media journalist class. And in that process, the concept of buying power, which is just meant to measure how much money on one level, how much money can working people get paid before they, you know, so that they can consume without rebelling? Tweaked for black people 
how do we keep them from rebelling by enticing them in, with this fantasy of upward mobility that we that will be used siphoned through a black bourgeoisie and again that capitalist commercial press class to attract the ad revenue so that black people don't rebel and black people don't seek to, to become organized politically and are enticed through entrepreneurialism this was uh most aggressively weaponized under the nixon administration and has since sort of taken hold, where Nixon literally said he wanted to redefine black power as black capitalism. And as you see here in these examples, redefine black power as black success in uh, the business world, in, in Amer American middle-classness, in supporting mainstream electoral politi politicians uh, themselves uh, sponsored by the most elite in society. So in its, just skipping ahead again for the sake of time, um, with that again, so the, 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 the turning point of the 20th century with the emergence of the concept, another turning point in the middle of the 20th century with the black adoption of the concept and the black bourgeois capitalist press commercial class adoption of the concept to the modern version, the newest turning point of the rise of the Selig Center's reports the heavy promotion of those reports, their, their collusive relationship with the Nielsen Group and the Black press, um, all to promote where we are today, this ultimately a Black capitalist argument for survival and liberation or redefinition of liberation as Black capitalism uh, with this fantasy of an, of an economic condition that doesn't exist. So uh, as I'm trying to show here from, uh, from the, the multicultural economy report from the Selig Center, as they say here, we have also helped create conscious consumers who are aware now more than ever how their economic power has a direct impact on the marketplace overall. So my point in quoting this is that what they're looking at is how do we redirect what money is that Black people earn through work to in this primarily white owned businesses. How do we do that? Well, we wanna create this idea that they are economically powerful, but have that term power defined as its impact on the marketplace. That is its impact on its ability to enrich the corporations that dominate the economy. The collusive relationship, as I've said, also exists with, the, the, with Nielsen. Whereas it says here, quote, we are proud that the combined Nielsen and NNPA resources, that is the na uh, nas national newspapers, <laughs> the National Newspapers Press Association, right? Oh my goodness, uh, I, I'm, I'm blanking for some reason, but it's the largest collection of black owned news, news media, news press in, in the country. Works with Nielsen to galvanize, uh, uh, um, Combine resources which have galvanized corporations and consumers alike to think and behave differently toward valuing the African-American consumer and their economic national newspapers press association. Anyway, anyway I'll get it. I'll look at it. I'll, somebody would be some, I'm sure somebody knows. Uh, valuing the African-American consumer and the economic impact on the US marketplace. So again, uh, what they recognize as buying power, meaning the ability to enrich the existing owners of the economy is redefined and repromoted and, and pundit, through punditry and propaganda passed on to black audiences as actual economic strength. I point here to Roland Martin's show as a, as a prime example of this. It's, it's since been moved deeper within his website, but this is just a, another modern day popular example of how the myth is, permeates. And unfortunately, uh, his program just in general does a lot of promotion of bad economic analysis and mythology, which is another extended conversation. But as it says on his own website, 
quote, all of this presents a unique opportunity to bring the African-American community, which according to Nielsen wields 1.3 trillion in spending power, a daily news program that disseminates information ignored by the mainstream media and brings diverse perspectives to a media landscape that largely marginalizes them, end quote. And what he's saying is he's telling people like McDonald's and Verizon with whom he has sponsorship arrangements. He's telling them, I am going to deliver you a community that is, has 1.3 trillion to spend on your products, which on one hand might be okay if it wasn't rebroadcast and promoted back to black audiences as an actual sign of economic strength that were if it used more properly uh, uh, and with more literacy and intelligence could, could alleviate some of the inequality that we continue to see in this country uh, and as it continues to worsen in fact. Um, Actually, this this is only in there because one of the, the people that I tracked and reported, I should say, or covered the reporting of over the years, and actually was on programs with her uh, indirectly at one point. Um, Cheryl Grace, who worked for Nielsen in helping promote this mythology, had had went had to go last year and actually sue Nielsen for racism against her, which I just thought was. Interesting. Um, one of the other reasons why this mythology permeates, and one of the or and or or said differently, one of the negative impacts of this mythology permeating is that activists and organizers who want to be involved are uh, mistakenly picking up this mythology as well. So, this is an example from the ongoing relationship between One United Bank, a Black-owned bank, uh, and Black Lives Matter, and promoting. Uh, black buying power as something that is actually powerful and real uh, um, and is is encouraging a, a black capitalist entrepreneurial response to political problems of inequality. So as it says here uh, about that relation, whoops, 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 a uh, historic, whoops, whoops, whoops. No, I don't want it. All right. Okay. A historic partnership is born between One United Bank, the largest black owned bank in the country and Black Lives Matter to organize the $1.2 trillion in spending power of black people. Uh, so again, as if there is this pool of money that exists and as if it's just disorganized and misused when it's just really an, a, a black owned bank wanting to capture some more black deposits uh, for its own benefit. And we could have another discussion. I talk a little bit about it in the book about why black owned banks don't aren't going to help and aren't helpful uh, to the collective that is. One of the things, I, one of the mythologies tied to the myth of buying power is this concept that is constantly reported over and over again. And in the book, I, I go through uh, how there's this, this is reported uh, over and over and over again, but that, that the, the uh, buying power of black America is the equivalent to the GDP or the gross domestic product of other countries, making black people the 10th or the 16th largest economy, whatever, 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 whatever. We hear that all the time. But the problem is of course, that that's entirely wrong. And I even had an on air radio debate with the head of uh, right in DC, um, um, B Doyle Mitchell, the head of uh, industrial bank at the time. I don't know if he still is in DC who totally misunderstands this. So he's either even as, as the head of a bank, he's either, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand how he could, but he totally misunderstood this exact point. And he was saying that our buying power, he said, in fact, is our GDP. And I was trying to say, that's not what GDP is. Gross domestic product is a measure of the wealth created for those who own the economy. It is not a measurement of income. It is not a measurement of wealth. It is not a measurement of inequality within an economy. So nobody who, who wants to assess any group of people honestly as an economist or elsewhere uses GDP to assess the, the condition of a particular group or even a country uh, or particularly the inequality within the country. It's just, an, it's just an assessment of how much money ultimately goes to those who uh, uh, own the goods and the services and the products that are bought, sold, and traded in a, in a given year. So that that that's part of the mythology that is is promoted. And then we're we're told that if if we did better, we have this enormously powerful economy, and we just ignorantly misuse it. All right. So um, actually, so 
actually I can stop here, but, but what I'll, so, so what buying power is in reality is, uh, and in fact, I detail, I try to, de well, I actually try to detail this in the book, but the problem is the concept has, has no real meaning. So if you go to the Selig Center report, which costs $125 to get, um, it, it shows, and I can actually pull it up here. Let me stop sharing this and share one more thing. And I'll sh show you what exactly I'm talking about. Um, this, is, uh, this is just the, the um, from, from my book, which uh, this is the Kindle copy. Um, the digital copy is free, by the way. You can get it at imixwhatilike.org. Just download it. Um, but as it says here, the Selig Center estimates are consistent with uh, concepts and definitions used in the National Income and Products Account. Readers should note that buying power is not the equivalent of aggregate money income as defined by the Census Bureau. The Selig Center doesn't use the Census Bureau. Because the Selig Center's estimates are based on the disposable personal income data obtained from the BEA rather than money income values issued by the Census Bureau, the result is significantly higher. This, the result is significantly higher estimates of buying power. This is from their own report, quoting from their own methodology. As they say here, because there are no direct measures of the buying power of African Americans, Native Americans, Asians, whites, and Hispanics, these estimates were calculated usually using, using national and regional economic models, univariate forecasting techniques, and data from US government resources, sources. But they never explain what any of that is, by the way. Their, their univariate forecasting techniques, they don't tell you what that is. The model developed, which they don't show you in their own report, by the Selig Center integrates statistical methods used in, in regional e economics with those of market research. In general, the estimation process uh, has two parts, estimating disposable personal income and allocating that estimate based, estimate based estimate by race or ethnicity based on the population estimates and variances in per capita income. Um, it should be also emphasized that the Selig Center's estimates are not equivalent to the aggregate, aggregate consumer expenditures as reported in the consumer expenditure survey, survey that is conducted each year by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. And why is that? The simple point is, and then I'll just stop here. We can do, do Q&A and, and discussion. The simple point is the Selig Center is, is through no observable model basically just taking the total sum that black people are paid in income in a given year and saying all of that is available to be, which is basically how you calculate the one plus trillion dollars in, in, in buying power. If you take every penny, and I go through this in, in greater detail in the book to, to show how they're doing this, but if you take all the money black people earn in a given year and they spend all of that, every penny of that, that on businesses and corporations and products they do not own. That is how you estimate theirs and any other group's buying power who are measured by the Selig Center. That is, again, the Selig Center who explains in their own literature, their only goal or their primary goal is to unite specifically Georgia business owners with those looking to buy ad space from those or in or who, who <laughs> I'm sorry, they're trying to, to put Georgia business owners who want to buy ad space for their products with media uh, and want to show those businesses through paid reports what communities have what money to spend on those products and what money you should as an ad buyer allot to those particular companies. Uh, communities rather, so that you can capture them. So you want some black folks, you put some black people in the commercial. You want some such and such, you put them in the commercial and target it that way. That's what it's for. But then it gets reported through black presses who want to attract ad revenue by convincing them that we have money we don't have 
it comes back to us as audience members that we do have this money and we're just fraudulently and foolishly spending it on cars, rims, hair, nails, et cetera. And if we were smarter, we would invest it like the Jews and the Asians and everybody else. Um, and it just leaves out so much about how every community is actually doing economically and how they got to be uh, in the positions that they are. So I'll stop there. Um, and hopefully I can clarify anything that I didn't get to uh, uh, in, in the initial presentation through Q&A. Thank you again. Well, thank you so much. That was a crash course in economics. Uh, I deal with letters, I don't deal with numbers, but I think this is very essential for us to understand the power of the dollar, having been imported into this country and called currency, to now know that the actual currency we make has an impact on both the optics, of how we see ourselves represented in the market force, as well as those ways in which our minds are manipulated to be more consumer-based than investment-based. So thank you so much for that. So um, just a quick note, I forgot to mention at the outset, we have a national theme every year and our national theme this year is Black Health and Wellness. And we in the Bethel Dukes branch have taken that to mean financial health and wellness, spiritual health and wellness, physical health and wellness and such. So we're looking at it's spiritual, yeah, all of those areas. So we thank you so much for kicking this off in terms of financial health and wellness, because the, the, the money or the ability to have the capital to do what we need to do is essential. So with, even with Woodson, the first uh, five presidents, one of them was an economist within our first five presidents of the association. So they understood the idea of the black dollar being kind of generated in the community. So um, just to also note, Fred Hampton was murdered on December the 4th, 1969. So you had it right at the outset. Right, yeah. yeah, you Thank had you. it right at the outset. So in light of all of this, in my own kind of naivete, what I would like to know from you in terms of the idea of black power equals black capitalism is what Jay-Z is promoting. And so how much of a shill is he in this in terms of using that, whereas LeBron James, I think, is not as much um, kind of in the pocket of corporations. Could you kind of explain the nuances of how the super wealthy in the African-American community view their wealth and their influence to kind of persuade people to, to buy certain things? I well, the short very elementary, but could you? Well, yeah, and 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 we might have to. I, I would have to look more closely at LeBron, and and I don't know ultimately if if we would agree on that one. Um, but but but, Jay Z is the reason I I pointed him one is because uh, he was my biggest contradiction as a music fan, and up up until the Black album, he was one of my favorite MCs. So I'm very familiar with his work, and his whole his whole catalog from the beginning till today has been the same. It has been. I have money, I know how to make money. I'm I can make more than you. I will always make more than you and if you if if you could be like me, we might be better. So mo most recently he he was he was heavily promoted with one of the more recent albums that he came out with it with in this in this um uh with this particularly with the story of OJ with the whole, you know, uh um uh you know, well, he's done black Republicans with Nas. I mean, he's got a number of, I mean, he's got a, a, a number of issues, but most recently was this, this whole thing of, of uh, um, if I had been better making investments earlier in my career, I would be better off now. Uh, and he more or less, and he may actually come out and directly and say it, if I remember correctly, in saying, if we all did that, if we were all better with our money, we could be better off. In other words, in, in, in misunderstanding entirely how poverty is, is created, what are the limitations of wealth creation, et cetera, and so forth, particularly within, within black communities. So uh, uh, um, anyway, the long story short is all these celebrities are often included with, which is happening big time right now with the cryptocurrency world, they're, they're heavily uh, um, promoted uh, and platformed to promote and, uh, and, and to disseminate these ideas of black capitalism and entrepreneurialism as, as legit responses. Uh, because as I'm trying to argue, there is this, this history of an overt attempt through Nixon, the counterintelligence program and otherwise to say, we don't want black people struggling for actual political power. We wanna tell them to start businesses and start from the ground up and bootstraps and all this other kind of stuff, which is never how wealth is created. It's not how white people got their wealth. It's not how any group has ever become wealthy. Uh, um, yet we're given this specific instruction uh, with all the specific limitations put on black people. So there is no, you should be like this group or do what that group did. 
Uh, and if there is an individual success story like Jay-Z or LeBron, it, it is, it, instead of it being promoted as just that, an individual success story, it's promoted attached to these uh, 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 sort of parallel mythologies back to Black people as, see, they did it, you can do it. Like, what's wrong with you? And that's what I'm trying to, in some small way, challenge. I love the challenge. I guess if people have questions, they can raise their hand and I gladly will call on you. But I think it's very fascinating that you call it a mythology because the idea of the origin story of an ethnic group is very important. So our ethnic group story is not akin to any other kind of voluntary migratory group to this country. Even West Indians or continental Africans who are right. physically African people but have a different origin story. So the, the native born or indigenous African American has a different origin story that can, is incomparable to anybody else. I mean, maybe right. slightly akin to the Native Americans, but still not even that comparable. So um, I love the idea of how we can uh, expose this myth and really empower these ideas of the uh, Susu. Now, they said that in Maryland that that was against the law. Michelle Singletary had a whole series on these kinds of small women's groups that would kind of meet and gather money and kind of turn it about. Again, it's against the law in Maryland to do that. So these other kinds of what we call underground economic efforts or these other kind of alternative funding sources where African-Americans have been successful in mutual aid societies, and you can kind of unpack all of that, are now either criminalized or seen as um, not legitimate in terms of the tax structure. So then how can we create a, a parallel system? And, and poverty is expensive, right? So the cash checking, right? And the old kind of payday loans. So, so if you're a working class person or a poor person with no bank account, it's expensive to be poor. That's so you right. literally don't have the capital to even set aside a 10 cents or a dollar. I mean, so how do you save when you're basically living hand to mouth? So all of this, how would you, what is the solution for that in terms of our community? And let's say two or three steps, if that's even possible. So, so well, what I do with, with the book and in just in general with my argument is the only way to achieve what, what could be considered parity or equality or whatever would be to have political power. Now, how we get that and what exactly that would look like is leads a lot more discussion and debate. But my point really is to say, whether they're made illegal or not, uh, the, the alternative uh, uh, economy and business practices that have constantly been developed or constantly still being developed are not a solution. They cannot evolve to be uh, all encompassing for the entire community, uh, simply because you cannot create wealth out of nothing unless you are in political power and have a huge military behind you. So uh, um, uh, even people like Dr. Jessica Gordon Emhard in her work on co cooperative economics and others who focused on this, uh, what I think she and others have done in addition to, you know, separate from the great contribution that they're offering, one mistake I think that, that, that she and others are making with that, with that argument, similar to what I think Dr. Amos Wilson did with his reading of Du Bois limited to, the, to that moment in the 1930s primarily, is, is they misread the issue of buying power and what, what actual economic strength exists. Uh, um, uh, black people have no wealth. Black people's wealth is gonna hit zero soon. Uh, the, the income divide has not closed in any meaningful way with, you know, uh, in the last 50 years. There's so, and so all the real economic indicators of, of, a, of a community or uh, of a people show a, a horrific condition already and something worse on the horizon. So um, uh, this idea that we could pool our resources and out of that emerge some sort of um, collective uh, uh, solution is part of the in, in encouraged mythology here. So it be meant to walk us away from what I already acknowledge is a more difficult and challenging struggle of assuming political power, which would then mean having control over how wealth is defined, who gets it, how it's distributed, what constitutes wealth, et cetera. That's where that's where real power lies, and how we get that—that's another discussion. But that's what I think is—is is, that's what I think needs to be the discussion, as opposed to we can't get there until we get our money right and can start buying the politicians like everybody else. That's never going to happen. That cannot happen by definition. If 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 uh, of, of 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 capital accumulation or the separate definition of the, 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 the divide that exists and can never be closed. I mean, it's, the, the idea of catching up uh, uh, or reaching parity is, is, again, part of the mythology. So, uh, And then uh, I'm still looking for hands, and I, I gladly, if anyone wants to chime in, please uh, 
either raise your hand or unmute yourself here, but we're, we're recording, so we want to be rather civil with this. But I know that in this com current generation of, our, let's say, college age students, how that is projected that they will not exceed their parents' success That's in right. terms of the student loan debt and how that the student loans are unregulated. And Biden promised to forget some things and so on and so forth. And he's kind of floundering because of the internal struggle with his party. So what would be, is it a third party solution that might be the, what we're looking at doing? Or what would be a logical uh, two-step approach to this? And I see some hands raised, so I might abbreviate your response to get sure, some more I, persons in this conversation, but if you could, sir. I, my, the shortest answer I have is I, I you know, I, I self-define as a Malcolm X voter. And if we go back and read his, what he argued was our, what should be our engagement with the electoral political world. I agree with that. We need to organize ourselves as a block. We need to create our own politicians uh, and candidates and our own platforms and our own bright line issues uh, to borrow from the late Glenn Ford. I think we need to have certain uh, particular goals in mind. Uh, uh, I, I know some would prefer that we we have something called, you know, akin to reparations, whatever that is. But I would think as long as whatever it is, it needs to include things like a debt jubilee, cancellation of all debts, uh, which I think is much more important than income uh, increases or even, uh, you know, payments, et cetera. Um, uh, but yeah, I think we should organize is blocks electorally consider alternative parties is the, the, the people's move the people's party emerging people's movement part movement for people's party emerging uh um i, I don't know I, i've even argued the after party solution just just to give a, a a cute name to to a to a block formation that i'm advocating but but really what i'm saying is initially we need to get off of these myths about the economy and then once we get clear on that we can get into rooms get offline join political organizations and start having more of the kinds of conversations i think we need to be having other as opposed to the, the prevalence of this this argument around uh, our, our money getting right okay i saw dr briscoe then i saw miss flamer and then rick adams in that order dr bristow miss flamer and then mr adams You're still muted, Dr. Briscoe. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bell. Uh, Dr. Ball. Did I get it right, Dr. Ball? It's okay. <laughs> Close enough. Thank you. Dr. Ball, I love the way you are demythifying the myth of our buying power. But I, I and I, I was also um noticing how the Hispanic buying power has far surpassed us. But then now I'm thinking. What, what is our true buying power? So that the myth of us having that $1.4 trillion uh, dollar buying power, what is the actual buying power? I mean, how, what is it? So I, I, thank you for the question. And, and, and I may have been rushing and not laid it out properly, but there is no real buying power. I kind of was thinking of that, that the, not the new one, but the first Matrix movie where the little bald kid is telling Neo there is no spoon. Like, you, they, like there is no buying power. The concept itself only w exists so that corporations and the state can help manage how much people are being paid and how much people can pay corporations uh, uh, or the press for, for ad space. That's it. it so the the again we uh i don't have the figures in front of me i do quickly run through some of them in in the book but they're they're all over the place if we get outside of the 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 press accounts attached to this mythology we don't have any money so the so you know his birthday his holiday his celebration just passed you know the real dr king was advocating for not just nonviolence, but direct action. Because at the end of his life, even in his last book, where do we go from here, chaos or community? He says, quite to the to the to the contrary of what people, some prominently placed people like Maggie Anderson have done, totally misrepresenting him by saying that he was in support of black uh, businesses and recognized their co contribution, and that he said we, you know, he was a supporter of buy black and bank black and all this kind of stuff. When he explicitly says, and where do we go from here? That that will not work. That that we need federal involvement. We need universal basic incomes. We need universal health care. We need debt cancellation. The only way wealth is created or or redistributed is through federal public policy. The elite know that. That's why they have what they call regulatory capture uh, over the government. 
when they when they when 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 they run out of money, they come up with the Hope and the Cares Act and create trillions of dollars out of nothing. Since 2008, they created 29 trillion dollars, 29 trillion dollars out of nothing, and gave it to the biggest banks on Wall Street. So, and then they turn around and tell us, no, you no 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 no, you need to save your money and start a business and and stop spending money on eight dollar lattes and all that other stuff. Sure, that could I mean we could be you know whatever. But but it, I'm not saying we should just be out here throwing money away. But what I am saying is that's not where the inequality comes from. So I don't pretend to know exactly what to do. And I feel like I've strayed from your question again, but but uh, um, just getting excited. But but anyway, well, let me just stop. Thank you, Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Flamer. But there is no Mr. buying Ed. power. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Dr. Dr. Ball. Dr. Ball, my question, thank you for this uh, very insightful presentation. Um, I just want to hear you comment on the um, United States, the tax structure. I had started reading over the summer, The Whiteness of Wealth, which um, I encourage people to read that book as well. I'm gonna, I can't wait to read yours. Thank you. No, thank you for that. Uh, I, I, I'm by no means an expert. By the way, I, at some point it was said that I've done something about economic... My analysis of this really comes from more of a, of a media studies than an economics one. So, so the economics I'm referring to are just the reports that I read as someone interested in this that are, I think, willfully kept out of the press. So I don't claim to be some economics expert. I just find that there's a huge gap between what economic experts actually say and what ad revenue and marketers say and what the press reports. That's that's where, you know, so similar to the tax question, I don't really know other than it, it you know, I just know some of the basics that the, it seems like the more wealthy one is or the bigger one's corporation is, the less they pay in taxes. Um, and and that we would do better as a country were we living somewhere where we paid more in taxes and got more back for free, which is, you know, so we're constantly being told that we aren't paying as much in taxes as those socialists over there in Scandinavia or whatever, but that's because we end up having to pay the bill for everything else on the other end. So I would rather see a public policy that said we are going to tax the creation of wealth, for instance, that in other words, that, that you can't become a Jeff Bezos. You can't, there can't become this kind of wild inequality because the wealth we are all helping to create. And, and I'll stop here, but remember when Bezos went up to space, the first thing he actually said on the podium, if I remember correctly during the, the, the panel was, I wanna thank all of the customers of Amazon because you are sending me to the moon or wherever. I was like, damn, he just, ex that's like the closest we've come to exposing the capitalist mythology ever because he acknowledged right there that it's the exchange, it's the production from workers and the exchange from consumers that creates the wealth. Yet why is he the only one with it? As if he did all of this, as if the elite did all it. We all do all of this every time we pay a bill, pay a, you know, buy a product, pay our taxes. We create all of this wealth. So we just need a policy that says, if the GDP of the United States is $20 trillion, we've all contributed to that. So it should just get put, so, so the $20 billion that would, is said would eradicate all houselessness, that's easy. The, the 1 trillion that would wipe out all student loan debt, that's 1 20th of one year's GDP. So why don't we have all of that? Why are we why are we listening to Biden tell us we can't even get fifteen dollar minimum wage because of some guy in West Virginia? I mean, it's just crazy. That's that's what I that's what I'm saying. So I don't. I, I, anyway, I'm sorry. I hope that somewhat answers the question. But Mr. Adams, and then I saw Mrs. Flood. So Mr. Adams. Yes, uh, Brother Ball. Thank you for your um, presentation, and I want to say I greatly admire the work you do. Whenever I can I check out the mixed tape uh, presentations? Uh, we got to expand as people, as a people, our understanding. We got to take a global vision. At once, we got to do the all politics is local and per, and personal. So we got to control our neighborhoods, our families, the block we live on. We don't even do that. We talk about big issues of the United States. The other thing is that, uh, and I offered this in the um, chat. They're just like one white man that got as much money as all the black people, 40 million black people. That's it, that hint, hint, <laughs> Boaz, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gates. You can name a handful, 10 black, 
10 white men have more money several times over than this 1.4 trillion they're crowing about black people having. Um, we need to also realize we're an empire. And as you correctly pointed out, uh, Dr. Ball, the people who got power, real power, number one, when you talk about money, you're the people that can print money. You know, they can print all the money they want and say why it's backed up. And if we believe it, it's almost more psychological than a, than a physical kind of objective thing that we're dealing with. As long as we trust in that money in our hands and we barter, we trade with it, people give us goods for it, everything is cool. The day we start doing that, that's a problem. We are so intertwined in the world, and I'll enter with, end with this. Follow our desire. A big issue, particularly devastating our community, is the phony war on drugs, which is a war on us. But if you study from slavery to today, there are certain things that are in common, whether it's molasses, whether it's cotton, whether it's alcohol, whether it's cocaine, whether it's marijuana, it's stuff we consume and we like get pleasure out of it. So it has value. And then they pimp, they exploit, and they enslave people produce that. It's the same story. You can go in the Bible and see the very same story. It's over and over again. The king, uh, Herod, uh, taxing the people. When you look at it, it's always about that. Taxation of the masses so that they can get a surplus for the few. And until we expand our consciousness as workers and consumers in an economy that has never been seen before, there hasn't been a digital economy. And I don't know, maybe Genghis Khan or somebody that conquered the world at that time had a unitary kind of structure. But today, basically the socialist or communist sector has been destroyed. The aligned, unaligned movement is not there anymore like it was in the days of Malcolm and Nkrumah and the great leaders of the 60s and 70s and the national liberation movements. So we got to find our way and African people will lead us there. Or. Thank you for that. Our <laughs> last question or comment will be from Mr. Flood or Miss Flood. I know the hand had been up and down, so uh, pardon me for mis mispronouncing your name. Please speak. That was a that was a mistake. Dr. Bristow asked the question I was thinking of. Oh, very well. Thank you so much, Miss Flood. Mm -hmm. I will now then uh, like to thank Dr. Ball and thank you as an audience for being with us. I'm, I'm excited about this, that we now have to start to think about our financial and political footprint in the 21st century as we look at the Georgia being a minority majority state soon and other kinds of, like I say, school board and other elections that really kind of set the needle on what fiscal policies are happening. I just want to state that next month we'll be meeting with Steve M. Hughes, who's a financial wellness expert. We'll have our flyers out for that as well. I would like to close by having Eric White, our program chair, committee person, come back and give our final greetings. And thank you all. Dr. Ball, have a great semester. I know it starts for you on Monday, I believe. That's right. And thank you for uh, letting us know about the media. Our eyes are a gate. We need to be very careful what we let go into our gates. So mm. back to you, Eric, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. This is just the beginning of a conversation that uh, we at Bethel Dukes have hoped started and that you and other branches around the country will uh, pick up on and um, find ways that we can talk to each other and continue this, this conversation. As Ida was, Dr. Uh, Jones was saying, next month uh, we will have uh, Stephen Hughes who will be talking about financial wellness. And that's just another kind of bringing it home in terms of things that we need to be thinking about, uh, the psychology of you know, how we handle and, and manage our money and resources, and you know, you might give us some ideas that we can kind of follow up on um, as we move forward. And uh, lastly, I'd just like to mention that if you want to get in touch with us at uh, Bethel Dukes here in Washington, DC, and uh, are interested in partnering with us on some of uh, the programs and initiatives and speakers that we will be having in the future, uh, please, uh, you know, take down the uh, post office box or our email address and reach out to us. Uh, uh, Dr. Ball talked about a number of things that, uh, uh, and he's a professor at a university, so this is a, a uh, semester-long course in terms of information that he was sharing with us today. And uh, but we need to find ways of keeping this conversation alive 
keeping in touch with each other, um, supporting our national organization and seeing what we can do locally to uh, reach out to our community and students and, and keep this message moving forward. So we wanna thank you and everyone for being a part of this program today. And we look forward to you joining us next month for our, on February the 27th. And, you know, we will move on from there. So thank you. And we bid you adieu. And thank you, Dr. Ball, for the information that you, the wealth of information that you, that you expose us to, shared with us, um, put in perspective for us uh, just to get uh, that conversation started. No, thank so, you all. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Take care, everybody. All right. So thank you. And we will just look forward to seeing you next month.